we're in a series called Doubting God, and every week in this series we're exploring different types of doubts that maybe arise throughout your faith journey. Uh, and and we, next week's going to be a really fun one. I think next week is we're talking about the, the odd conundrum, of, which isn't a conundrum at all, of faith and science, and uh, that's going to be a fun one. Next week, we're gonna, the week after that, we're going to talk about when it feels like God has abandoned you. Uh, but today, I want to talk about uh, one of the really interesting things, uh, one of the biggest reasons people doubt God, and, and when I say doubt God, it's, it's actually they doubt Christianity, and, and what's so interesting about it is very rarely do I ever meet somebody who doubts Christianity because of the way Jesus loved. You ever meet anybody who's like, man, Jesus sucked at loving people. I don't believe in Christianity because of the way Jesus loved people. No, me neither. I've never met anybody who doubted Christianity because of the way Jesus loved. I've never met anybody who doubts uh, Christianity because of the way Jesus lived. Uh, one of the biggest reasons people doubt Christianity is because of the things Jesus claimed. See, Jesus made these huge and, and powerful claims. I believe he substantiated them, but they're hard for people to grasp. Let, let me illustrate to you this way. Uh, you probably noticed in our culture today, you can mention God or spirituality in casual conversation or in public conversation, and usually it doesn't ruffle fe- people's feathers very much, just if you keep it towards God and spirituality. Like, like you see an uh, athlete win a game or competition or a match, and they're like, oh, praise God. And, and people don't really, they don't really uh, make a big deal out of it. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, good job. Or, or a celebrity gives a speech and they thank their friends and their family and they say, and, and thank, thank God. But have you ever noticed that when you add Jesus to the conversation, the conversation can get really tense really quickly? And the reality is it's not because of how Jesus loved or lived most often. It's because of the things he claimed. And what's so interesting, it's interesting that these conversations can become tense when we talk about Jesus. You know why it's so interesting? Most people really like and respect Jesus. Whether they're Christians or not Christians, most people who know about Jesus really respect and like Jesus. Jesus. And, and let's, let's pause for a moment. There are a couple billion people on planet earth who have never heard the gospel and we need to take the gospel to the end of the earth so that every single person hears the gospel. Amen, Restore Church? But the people who know about Jesus, most of them like Jesus. So it's interesting that it becomes such a tense conversation. And, and let's, let's, uh, let's, Talk about this for a second, right? Like, you don't have to be a Christian to like the guy that loves sinners, amen? You just look at what Jesus did, and you're like, yep, respect. Crazy, mad respect. Like, what, what did Jesus do? Uh, Jesus was so gracious to people. The, uh, the amount of power and ability Jesus has as the Son of God, uh, he, he could have used it differently, right? Like, like all the powerful, prominent people of society wanted Jesus to want them, right? A lot of his issues were because they were jealous that Jesus did what? He purposely spent his time taking care of the poor and the hurting and the broken and the downtrodden. He went and he spent his time with them. He, he stood up to, uh, to prominent leaders of society who mistreated those same people. He would, you know, he would uh, go after some of the leaders, so to speak, who would mistreat widows in a society that didn't take very good care of widows. He, he showed up to a wedding, and when the wine barrels were empty, he restocked it so the party could continue, right? Uh, when, when Jesus was uh, having a service on the mountainside, he, he took a boy's packed lunch, and he multiplied it and turned it into an all-you-can-eat picnic for 20,000 people. Like, it's easy to like Jesus. It, well, it's easy to like Jesus. And, and, then, and then, when you look at the way he lived and you look at the way he loved, it's, it's easy. But, but what people don't like are these exclusive and bold claims that Jesus made. Right, let's, let's, let's just pretend for a minute that even, even if we weren't Christians, right? If you weren't Christians, you look at Jesus and you're like, man, he is ridiculously humble, amen? The humility of Jesus. He, he would do what? Like, he would wash his disciples' feet. 
And if you, if you take some time, just Google later, washing feet in the first century, you see what an incredibly humble, humble, humble act it was for him to wash his disciples' feet. It was a job that was reserved for the most lowly people of society, and Jesus, the Master, the Son of God, went to his disciples, and he would wash their feet. Ridiculously humble. And then, the, at the same time, and I want to be careful with this word, because uh, I don't want you to misunderstand me, uh, in some ways, he wasn't very, he was humble, but maybe not modest. Okay? And, and what I mean by that is this. Um, he did these things where like Lazarus died, right? Say Lazarus died. Okay, So Lazarus died and then Mary and Martha, say Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, his sisters, they're losing it, right? Jesus, if you were here, maybe he wouldn't have died and, and, and he's dead and, and they're kind of freaking out. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't say, oh, well, that's life. What does he do? He says, well, no. I am the resurrection and the life. What a bold claim. What a bold claim. Or when the Pharisees got mad because he did miracles on the Sabbath. And they're like, you can't do these miracles on the Sabbath, Jesus. You can't do this. He says, no, 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 no. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus would make these bold claims. He made this incredibly bold claim. Uh, parents in the room, I want you to think about this towards your kids. Kids in the room, think about this towards your parents. Jesus said, if you love your mom or dad more than me, you are not worthy of me. That is a bold claim. See, people don't have really issues or doubts towards Christianity because of the way Jesus lived or loved. It's the things he claimed that create tension for people today. He has, these, he has these moments, like in John 14, this very powerful declaration that he made to comfort his disciples. He, he, says, he says, I'm going to go away and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Man, that's a, that's a good conversation to have, right? Jesus saying, I'm going to go make a place for you after you've spent some time with Jesus, seeing Jesus do what Jesus do, and I'm going to make a place for you. And, and Thomas is like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, where's this place? Where's this place? And, and the conversation kind of, kind of goes to the direction of, like, like, he's going to heaven. And then he makes this bold statement, perhaps the boldest statement Jesus ever made. In John 14, 6, 8, if you know it, he said what? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one gets to the Father. No one gets to heaven. No one gets to paradise. No one gets to this special place unless they go through me. What a bold claim Jesus made. And so people love the way Jesus loved. People love the way Jesus lived. People have trouble with the claims that he makes. See, I want you, I want you to think about, again, this, is, this, message is, this message is maybe training for the Christians in the room, but it's really for maybe the unbelievers in the room or maybe the unbelievers you know. Okay, because a lot of people, you go, you have this thought process in culture today that says, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold, hold on. The only, only way? Like, the only, only, o- when you say only, what do you mean by only? You mean, you mean the only of multiples? You know, we, we, there, it's, it, there's a tension, right? It's like, when you say the only way, that doesn't seem very fair. That seems pretty exclusive. Let me just make sure I heard you right. You said only, only, right? Yeah, I said only, only. And I didn't say only, only. Jesus said only way, only truth, only life. Triple only, right? And, and we say, well, some people would say, like, that doesn't seem very fair. That seems very exclusive. And, and maybe the conversation continues for some people. It's like, okay, okay, so well, that, that's your opinion. But your opinion's invalidating someone else's opinion. And so you're so right that everybody else is wrong. Of all the billions of people who believe other things, you're so right that everyone else is wrong. And I think that that thought is maybe worth following a little bit, right? Uh, And and some some people come to this other logical thought that that like, okay, hold hold on, hold on, hold on. You're so right that everyone else's theology is wrong, or or some people, they want to have this belief, okay? It probably doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're just really sincere. That's a really common belief today too, isn't it? As long as you just believe something really sincerely, that's, that's probably good enough. That's, that's what a lot of people believe. When, when we look at the exclusive claims of Jesus, we, we have these tensions. It's like, okay, Jesus said he's the only way, 
But, but I heard a lot of people say this, that there, there must be, all paths probably believe, lead to God. All paths lead to the same place. All faiths are pretty much the same. Has anybody ever heard that before? It's a really common thought, and I think if you're a Christian in the room today, you need to understand how to interact with those thoughts. In fact, you maybe have wrestled with those thoughts and just kind of bottled them down deep and never dealt with it, I think it's time to deal with some of those thoughts. Jesus was very, very clear. He said, I am the only, only, only way. Nobody, nobody, nobody gets to the Father except through me. And then we are bombarded with these messages. And some of them are like, like let's, let's be honest. Some of them, like, there's, there's some rationale behind them, right? It's like, it, it, it feels... It feels kind of good to be able to say, I'm not promoting this doctrine, but it feels kind of good to be able to say, well, everybody's okay. It doesn't matter what you believe. Everybody, there's, a, there's a kind of like a comfort if, if that was true, right? Like we don't have to worry about anybody anymore. Just everybody gets through. Everybody's okay. It doesn't, like it's not as big of a deal as maybe we make it out to be. I'm not promoting that doctrine. I just want to acknowledge, and you can, you can be shy and pretend that you don't think there's some comfort, that it feels kind of good if that were true. The problem is, it's not true. It's not true. Jesus is the only way. The only, only, only way. And what, what I want to do is, is I want to preface, I am unapologetically 100% live, breathe, and die a follower of Jesus. That, that's who I am. But I want to I shock some of you and, and say that, that there's actually, when we look at some of the other faiths we compare Christianity to, that, that there maybe is some beauty in some of these faiths. I'm not promoting some Unitarian doctrine today, so don't go the wrong direction with this, but, but I want to show you like some of the major world religions, because some people would, would still argue with you, they're all basically the same, and, and this religion gave me this beautiful thing in my life, and this faith gave me this beautiful thing, and, and there maybe are some beautiful things to acknowledge of these faiths, even though that they can't all be true. Is that fair? So what I'm going to do is, is apologetically, um, not unapologetically Christian, but apologetically, I want to look at some of the other faiths today for a few minutes. I'm going to go really fast, so I'm sorry. I'm not going to do a good job. I'm not going to be very thorough, uh, and I don't want to misrepresent them, but I'm going to do the best I can really quickly. So summarizing like five seconds with each one, like Buddhism, for example. Uh, Buddhism is a really interesting faith that believes there is no God. There's this, uh, there's this uh, cycle of countless births and rebirths. It's this never-ending cycle for the most part without like a final existence after this life. And Buddhism is often mixed up with or confused with something that's very different than Buddhism, which is called Hinduism. So you have Buddhism, say Buddhism. Then you have Hinduism, which is confusing, but different, okay? Um, similar, but different. So Hinduism does have a Buddhism, no God. Hinduism has a God. But the God of Hinduism is an impersonal God. And you approach this impersonal God, which is, this is really confusing for me, through multiple deities, statues, or idols that are different gods that are actually different mod- uh, manifestations of the one God. So it's like there's polytheism that leads to a monotheism. Uh, it's kind of interesting and kind of confusing, but I want to be respectful. Uh, so you have no God, one impersonal God, but what they have in common is, is there's no forgiveness of sins. There's no spiritual hope or spiritual help with Buddhism or Hinduism. Okay, uh, th- There's not that. There's only karma. Karma, and you've you maybe heard me preach before. A Christian, stop, stop letting karma into your Christian theology, okay? Uh, it comes from Buddhism and Hinduism, and it's not of Christ. But it does, it does seem like there is just a little bit of beauty and truth to karma. Jesus taught us what? The, pair, the, the principle of the sower. Jesus did teach us, you reap what you sow. There's still a difference between reap what you sow and karma. Uh, but, but karma is kind of what Buddhism and Hinduism kind of hang their hat on. If you do good, you get good back. You do bad, you get bad back. And then you have those, and then you have Islam. Okay, In Islam, you'd be a Muslim, and you would worship Allah if you were a Muslim. And there's no secondary gods in Islam. There's only one personal god. And there's a total ban on idols. And so, you know, keep those idols out of here. But, but in Islam, your standing with God depends on your religious devotion. It depends on your faithfulness. It depends on you and your good works in Islam. And by the way, Islam has some beautiful things. Uh, Islam has this principle of respect that anytime you would speak the name of a prophet in Islam, you would have to say, 
peace be upon him. So if I was ta- teaching you about Elijah, I would say, Elijah, peace be upon him. And then I continue my story about Elijah. Every time I say the name of the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, peace be upon him, was known as the weeping prophet. And there's this beautiful respect that comes from uh, Islam. And, and they, I, love, I love how Islam, all Muslims, if you're a devout Muslim, would, would have to pray at the same time consistently on a regular basis. And that, there's, there's some beauty if, if we were all praying at the same time every day. Um, and that's, that's Islam, and that's different than the New Age movement. The New Age movement is like there's no personal God, but someone in the New Age movement might be seeking like a higher level of consciousness where you're trying to become one with the universe or with the cosmos. And you take all of those things and then you contrast them to Christianity. Are you with me so far? Amen, Restore Church? Okay, you take them and you compare them to Christianity. And Christianity believes in a personal God who loves his people unconditionally. Who loves his people so much that he became one of us in the person of Jesus and sacrificed himself for the forgiveness of our sins. And I think already you see the stark difference between all of this and Christianity. They're very, very different. Uh, and some, So we have to acknowledge, maybe it feels good to be this Unitarian, all faith leads to God, and everything's going to be okay, and just believe sincerely, and all religions are basically the same. Maybe it feels good to say that, but it is completely untrue, okay? And, and while we can maybe be respectful, let's acknowledge, they can't all be true, because there cannot be no gods and many gods and one God who's an impersonal God, personal God and a personal God and an impersonal God and many gods that are personal and impersonal. You can't have all of those things at the same time, can you? Therefore, they simply cannot all be true. They cannot all be true. Uh, and they can, their, their contrary nature, contradictory nature, makes it impossible for them to uh, coexist in the way that we like to maybe pretend that they can. And when I say that, I'm not urging hatred or violence towards other faiths. I'm just saying that, that in the ultimate sense, they cannot be true and coexist in harmony. There's tension between them. What I want to do is I want to lead you to consider Jesus. I want you to just, as you look at all of these things, I want you to consider Jesus. And Jesus makes Christianity different than Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and and New Age movement, and this and that, and every other faith. There's nothing like Christianity because of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I want to be really clear. I'm not asking you to consider Restore Church, because Restore Church doesn't always get everything right. We are an imperfect church trying to serve a perfect Savior. Amen, Restore Church? And I'm not asking you to consider your pastor, because I will try my best. I promise you, I'm trying my best, but I'm susceptible to sin, and I'll let you down. I'm not asking you to consider me. And I'm not asking you to consider Christians, because though they are saved by grace through faith, they too are susceptible to sin. And, and man, I know some Christians who they are so kind and generous and loving and I'm so happy to claim them brothers and sisters in Christ. And then I know some Christians who are so mean and hateful and judgmental that I apologize and I want to maybe pretend that they're not part of the family. And uh, so I'm saying, don't consider Christian. I'm saying consider Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Consider Jesus. I want to show you three things to consider about Jesus. Uh, number one, consider the ministry of Jesus. Consider the way Jesus loves people and, and the outcome of Jesus loving people, right? So, so for example, uh, Jesus, you can contrast him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were these religious leaders, and they would, they would snub people based on their unrighteousness or, or their problems or their issues. So, so like if somebody had maybe some loose morals or a, a sinful past or maybe some tragic ailment, uh, these guys uh, despised them, they rejected them, they would snub them, even to the degree where, where they, they wouldn't let them into synagogue. Are you understanding that? It's as if, as if maybe you had some unfortunate ailment or, or some sin, mistake that you made last night, and we checked you at the door on your way in, and we're like, all right, you can come in, you can come in, you... Nope. Not going to make it today. Mm-mm. And we wouldn't let you into synagogue because of what you did last night, or maybe this, this problem that happened to you physically that you have no control. And we're like, yep, 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 nope, nope, yep. And, and can you imagine a world like that? 
See, they were in a world like that, and when Jesus came onto the scene, what did he do? He loved the people despised and ignored by the world. He loved them. Like Mark uh, 2, 16, it says, When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, and I want you just to imagine this. Imagine, imagine you're in a world where you're the outcast of society. Okay? And you're sitting with this, this prominent, powerful, admirable rabbi, who I believe is the son of God, and you're, you're dining with him. And the people, the ruling people of your society, come over and they question why he's with you. And he goes to them and he says this. Can you imagine the compassion in his heart and the feeling in your heart as you hear him say this about you? He says, it's not the healthy who... Uh, need a doctor, but the sick. This is why I have come. Imagine that. Imagine that. He says, I've not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. Consider the ministry of Jesus where every other faith and other re- of every other religion is built on the principle of try to be better and good enough and do more and keep going. And Jesus comes and he says, hey, I'm going to meet you where you're at. I'm going to minister to you where you're at because you're the one I came for. Praise Jesus. You should be right now. Praise him. That's what he said. Because I said, imagine you're in the first century in this situation. Guess what? You are in the 21st century and you're in the same situation where Jesus said, I came for the sick, not the healthy. So consider the ministry of Jesus. Consider, how about the miracles? What do you do? Like he see a blind guy, he opened the blind guy's eyes. Praise God. He heals the deaf ears. He casts out demons. He walks on waters. He raises the dead. And here's what's really interesting. If you're a Jesus follower, right? And even if you're not a Jesus follower, share this with all of your non-believing friends. This is so interesting. Okay? His critics did not question the validity of his miracles either. Did you, want, did you ever catch that when you read the Gospels? When Jesus is doing miracles and ministry and all these wonderful things, his critics and his enemies, Never try, never criticized the validity. Their, their problem was that they, his his miracles were verified, and they couldn't do anything about it. So their their best solution was: we just want the miracles to stop. We don't like him, and so we just want his miracles to stop because they are real, and they're making our life difficult because he is a threat to our ministry. It was just jealousy of Jesus that brought his enemies to become his enemies. So so I want you to think about that. The ministry of Jesus. Consider his ministry. And consider maybe the person near you is the result of the ministry of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Maybe the person near to you, maybe your person near to you, next to you, is the result of the ministry of Jesus. I know I am. Man, I... I, Some of you know my story more than you wish you knew it because I share so much. And some of you don't know it at all. But I'm going to tell you, in my early teenage years, I mean, I I was just this dead... In my sins, lost, hurt, just broken person, okay? Uh, I lied, I stole, I cheated. I don't talk about this very often, but, man, I shoplifted, too, quite a bit when I was a teenager. I never got caught. I was really good at getting away with all the bad things I did. Uh, I, treated, I treated women very poorly. I was a selfish friend. I was borderline abusive to my mom and my siblings. And, and like, that was me, trapped in my sins apart from Christ, and then one day, my, my pastor, one of my pastors got me to start reading my Bible. And I'm, I'm reading the Gospel of Matthew. And if you're new to Christianity, man, start with Matthew. I read the Gospel. Everybody says John, but I say Matthew. Start with Matthew. And I'm reading the Gospel of Matthew. And what happened was, was one moment I was this way, and the next moment I was that way. Because I just saw the ministry of Jesus and something about, I had like, I'm not kidding, I have like this supernatural experience reading Matthew. And one moment I'm this way and then I encounter the ministry of Jesus and then suddenly I'm that way and I am fully surrendered to Jesus. Just my whole life is His. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I hope if you're here that you have a story like that. And if you don't have a story like that yet, I hope that it's happening right now. And by the time you leave here today, that you have a story to tell on who you were one moment this way and the next moment this way because of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Consider his ministry. Consider the resurrection of Jesus. Right? What do we know about this the Christian God, the Christian Bible? We know this, that he loves people so stinking much, but we also know that what? He hates sin. And the Bible teaches us that God became one of us in the person of Jesus, 
And Jesus, the Son of God, became sin for us on the cross. What a bold statement there, too. That he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. What a bold statement. Even more bold when you realize that, that he who knew no sin, the Son of God, uh, became sin for us on a cross, naked and ashamed, and when the creation mocked the Creator, Jesus, what did Jesus do? He's on the cross and He's praying for them, what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And then He said, what? It is finished. And then what did He do? He said, I did, basically, I did what you sent me to do, and into your hands I commit my spirit. And then when He died, what happened? The earth shook, and the Roman centurion who was there participating in his crucifixion saw this and marveled. He who doubted the divinity of Jesus looked and said what? Surely this man is the Son of God. And then three days later, there's a bunch of people who believe that the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty, and Peter, Peter, mind you, who three days Four days prior did what? He's like, he's like, no, I don't know. He's one moment he's like, Jesus, I'm gonna die with you, and then the next moment on the night Jesus was betrayed, what happened? He's like, I don't even know him. I don't even know him. I don't even know him. And then after this, to the very people he was afraid to acknowledge his association to Jesus with, he says this. He says, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. He said, we are witnesses to this. We saw it. We were there. We experienced. We touched him. We ate with him. He was dead, and now he is not dead anymore. And people come up with these things, like, like this was the story that's been floating around for 2,000 years. That, no, the disciples snuck in and stole the body. And I preached on this extensively in the past, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But, but you, you've heard this story. And I just want to ask you, do you know how preposterous the story that the disciples stole the body is? It is an outrageous story. Are you telling me that 11 untrained, unskilled, and uneducated men overpowered Roman guards and stole the body of Jesus when the Roman guards were there to make sure they could not, in fact, steal the body of Jesus? No, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Or even worse, that they snuck in, they snuck in, stole the body, and got away without a trace? It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous theory. By the way, we also have testimony of the guards that that is not what happened. The testimony of the guards is recorded as saying what? He rose from the dead and we don't know what to do. So that is a silly theory. But, but even more than that, it gets, it's an even crazier theory. Are you ready for this? Do you, do you believe that 11 untrained, uneducated men snuck in, stole the body of Jesus, and then completed the greatest scheme of deception in the history of the world and kept it a secret for 2,000 years without getting caught? That's even crazier than them stealing the body that they could keep it a secret for 2,000 years. And at the very least, do you want to hear this? They did it without personal gain. You know, normally if you commit a big scheme, you're going to become rich and powerful as a result. Or some, some, there'd be some personal gain, Right? Anybody here, if you're going to pull off the scheme of the century, you do it for personal gain, not for personal loss. Are you with me? Amen, Restore Church? But they committed, if, allegedly, if they committed this scheme, they did it at great personal loss rather than great personal gain. Because we know that 11 uh, of the 11 remaining disciples, we're excluding Judas, they all died a martyr's death. Except for the lucky guy named John who was boiled alive in a uh, vat of oil and then survived and then was banished to an island called Patmos where he received revelation that we're going to start studying here in a couple weeks. So they did all of that for no personal gain and then hundreds of other people saw Jesus resurrected. Hundreds of other people saw Jesus resurrected. And then they also were willing to give their life for it. Beforehand, they they're think it's over, and then all, all of a sudden this thing called the resurrection happens, and then they all die for it? Consider, please, please consider the resurrection. And then finally, consider the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus. Before we get to the message of Jesus, I want to go to 1 John 1. Uh, he's, uh, John says, don't believe every spirit. 
Uh, This is important because you're going to hear people say other things that are not biblical about Jesus. You're going to hear people tell you it's maybe not right to say all ways are not the way and Jesus is the only way. But, But John says, be careful so you don't believe every spirit. He says, I want you to test the spirits because there's many false prophets. There's going to be those trying to lead you astray in the world. And then John 4.2, 1 John 4.2, he says, How can you recognize the Spirit of God? Every spirit acknowledges what? That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And if you acknowledge that, that spirit is from God. Okay? I like how Tim Keller, Tim Keller says it this way. He points out that scripture, scripture, for the most part, doesn't say that Jesus was born. It says what? It says Jesus came. Like he was obviously born of the Virgin Mary, but it says he, he came into this world. He came into this world. What's the implication of that? The implication of that he came into the world is that he was somewhere beforehand. He was somewhere beforehand. He left where he was to come where he went. Amen, Restore Church? That's why you hear me often preach the gospel this way, that our Lord Jesus left the halls of heaven to walk the streets of earth, to live the life you could not live, to die the death you deserve, and to conquer the grave you could not conquer. Why? He came into this world from heaven to earth. And when you look at every other founding religion, uh, religious figure, they're always a normal human being. Just normal human being who started some sort of movement. But Jesus was God in the flesh who came into this world. This distinguishes Christianity from any and every option available to you. See, so many other religions, like, like many Eastern religions, will, they'll, they'll try to separate you from the world. You overcome the world through stages of consciousness that remove you from the world. Okay? Some would teach you that, that you escape this world by good moral behavior, by good works. You do this, do this, do this, so you can escape the pains of earth and the problems of earth through prayer, through this, through that. But Christ- Christianity tells us what? That God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, right? So whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What does Christianity tell us? We don't escape the world to God. God came to the world for those he loves. Amen, Restore Church. That he came for those he loves. And he doesn't just come to the world to save you and then you escape it. Then you get to live and pray on earth as is in heaven. And one day he will redeem this world. What will he do? He'll redeem death and disease and poverty and justice. He will right every wrong, correct every betrayal and bring justice to every crime. And he will redeem the world rather than trying to make you flee from the world. He will redeem you. He has redeemed you in Christ Jesus, his son. And one day you will reign with him. He has redeemed you to reign where? On earth with him. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth rather than having to escape it. Why? Because he came here rather than you having to escape there. Praise God on high. Let me, I, but I, listen, I can't convince you, and this is the thing, I, I can't convince you, and my heart breaks with thinking about how many people come here week in and week out without a real faith in Jesus. You come to church because it is. It's maybe this therapeutic thing for you, or it's maybe this life coaching thing, and it, it feels good, and it sounds good, and the music's good, and the preaching's pretty good, and, and everything's good, 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 and then, then you leave, and you never really had faith in Jesus. Let me just tell you, one day there will be one moment where you're here and then you're going to die and then you're going to be somewhere else. One moment you will be alive and one moment you will be dead. Dead, 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 dead. And you will go somewhere. You will go somewhere. And, and I'm not, I don't, like some of you, you believe you're going to become a butterfly and keep coming back and keep coming, come back, keep coming back. I'm not promoting that belief. Or, or some of you believe you go to heaven or hell. But you're going to go somewhere. And I think because you're going to go somewhere, you need to really do the homework and establish that you really believe what you say you believe. And I'm presenting to you. I can't make you believe. I wish I could. I wish I could just faith it for you. But you need to realize whether or not you really believe in Jesus. 
Because he made these exclusive and sometimes offensive claims that he is the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. One day you'll die. And younger people in the room, listen. I know you feel like you're immortal and you're going to live forever. I'm on that weird thing of not being young anymore but not quite being old yet. Like, like I know what it's like to feel like that young person. And you think that you can get it right when you're older. Listen, I just did the funeral for a 23-year-old friend of mine not that long ago. I've seen friends lose children not that long ago, right? Like, listen, just because you're young doesn't mean you shouldn't figure it out now. Because one day you'll be alive, one moment you'll be alive, and one moment you'll be dead. And I don't want to scare you into this. I just want to have a real, authentic conversation. And on that day you die, it won't matter how many Instagram followers you have, what shoes you wore, where you went on vacation, what career you had, or what you did. What will matter is, do you know Jesus Do you know the author of life, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the one true one, the Lamb of God who was slain for your sins? And and so you're going to have to answer this question, like, what is the meaning of life? And then some people go and they're like, well, the meaning of life must be truth, but truth is relative. You have your truth, I have my truth. And the reality is, is you're going to realize whatever truth, alleged truth, you choose to believe, here's what you're going to realize. Uh, Your truth will set upon you a set of rules because you have to live within a worldview that, that goes along with that truth. Does that make sense? If this is true, then these things are true with it. And you're going to realize that you are not great at living out your so-called truth. It's going to be hard to live it out consistently. And at the end of the day, you're going to realize that truth can't hug you and that truth can't love you. That truth can't forgive you. And so maybe you give up on truth. And then from truth, you go to love. Well, maybe instead of truth, the purpose of life is love. And you're like, I'm going to love everybody. I'm going to be this loving, inclusive, wonderful, popular, friendly person. I'm going to love everybody. Everybody's going to love me. And then you realize. And you're like, you're like I'm going to find that person to love. Like when they walk into the room, I have butterflies in my tummy. And my ha- hair stands on end. And, and, and I'll get all tingly-wingly, and you're going to be like, like when, when, he, when he walks into the room, ladies, you're going to be like, oh, there's my hero, right? And, and there's this person that makes all the love songs make sense. And then you realize, you realize that that person isn't your savior either. You realize that that person you met, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they, they let you down. They're imp- the point is they're imperfect like you, Right? They're imperfect like you, and, and they let you down, and, and uh, maybe they lie to you. Maybe they're self-centered. I don't know what they do, but they might not live up to your expectations. And then you conclude, well, well, just as truth can't love you, those who love you aren't always true. They're flawed, and, and you, have another, you have a problem. You have a problem. You have a problem. That, that every other source of hope, every other theory of hope is going to let you down. And then you do what many people have done. Maybe you abandon truth and you say, I'll do my own thing. And you say, I'll do what feels good to me. You become sick, cynical about love. And, and maybe you become that person who, who just posts hateful comments on social media all the time because you walk through life with bitterness. And I just want to give you a better option. The option is Jesus. I want to give you a better option. It's Jesus. And the audacious claim he made... The claim he made, he's not a hobby, he's not an add-on to your life, he's not a feel-good toy, he's not your therapy, that he is who he says he is, or he is just crazy out of this world. Either he is who he claimed he is, or he is just crazy, and you should run away from this place, and everybody who preaches him to you. Either he was and is who he claimed to be, or he's crazy and untrustworthy. And I'm saying consider him, not your pastor, not your church, not the person next to you. I'm saying consider him and his claim. And his claim is that he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. And suddenly you realize that truth is a person. Truth becomes a person who can hug you and love you. Uh, And because he's without sin, he's a love that will never let you down. And because he's the way, you can know where you're going with certainty and with faith and with confidence. And if you say, you look at all the options, you wonder, am I too bad for God? You realize it doesn't matter if I'm too bad for God because God was good enough for me that it's no longer about you, you, you. It's actually all about him, 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 him. We can say it this way. Some people spell religion, D-O. Do more, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. We spell in Christianity, done. D-O-N-E, done is how we spell it in Christianity. 
And then suddenly everything's changed. All these other faiths and all these other religions, they, they would tell you just, just work harder, work harder, work harder, do more, do more, do more, so that you can feel good about your salvation. And, and then you're going to say, well, pastor, why, why do you always tell us to serve so hard? Why do you push us to do so much? It's not because, it's not because you have to. It's not because if you're scared, you're scared you're not going to make it if you don't do this thing. It's because now you get to, in Christ Jesus, through the freedom you have from your sin, like I would just say, why wouldn't you want to serve the God of your salvation? Not because you have to, but then you, why wouldn't you want to serve the God who loved you, who you love? Amen, restore church. And why do we do it? Because he first loved us, that then we get to love him. So I just want to say, like, when people come up to me and say, well, Christianity is so exclusive. This is so exclusive. Uh, you mean I'm toast if I don't believe in Jesus? That's so exclusive. Listen, it's the most inclusive option there is. Nobody does what Jesus did. Jesus says the worst sinner, the most broken person, the person with the worst past, I want you to come to me so I can wash away your sins. Where everything else says be better and then come, Jesus says bring your worst and let me help you out with it. Amen, Restore Church. So, Father God, please... Please, Lord, make us consider Jesus the only true and sufficient option there is. Make Jesus make sense, Father. And God, I wonder if there's someone in the room who, who right now, they just needed to reconsider you. Maybe they loved you with this deep burning passion once, and maybe now is the day where you reignite that passion because they just needed to consider you again. Maybe they've been serving you so long that they started to go through the motions. God, maybe right now be the day that they, they just burn with that fiery love for you like they once had. That first love you speak about in scriptures. And Father, with, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if, if somebody in the room is ready to just get, get more serious about their devotion and their loving relationship with you, would you guys raise your hand if that's you in the room today? Father God, hands all over the room. I pray that you give them that. God, even if they're walking really, really close to you right now, that you just draw them deeper into that sense of love and awe and wonder for who you are. And God, maybe there's someone in the room right now who they've just been going to church and they've just been doing religion and maybe today's the day of their salvation where instead they just surrender to you. If you're here in the room today and today is the day that you want to receive salvation because you never have before, would you raise your hand so I can pray over you? Father God, we pray. We pray for these people with hands up. And God, I pray if there's someone who should put their hand up but they're embarrassed that somebody will see them that you give them boldness to put their hand up for you. And God, that they would just cry out in their heart, Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner, and I thank you for being a savior. Wash away my sins with the blood of Jesus. Bring me to life at the resurrection. Bring me alive right now through faith in Jesus. Fill me and seal me with your spirit, because I am yours, and you are mine. And all of God's people said, amen.